a way for you to get the respect you deserve, but what you got to do is challenge Balboa to fight man to man. Teacher against student, old lion against young lion. And it's the only way you're ever going to get peace of mind, because believe me when I tell you, that press is going to hound you with that man's legend for as long as you dare to wear boxing gloves. you got to get him into that ring, Tommy Gunn. Or you're gonna be in question like you heard tonight for the rest of your life. Then you're gonna start to ask yourself, could I really take him? Am I really good enough? Do people really think I'm a cheap carbon copy or a second-rate pretender who only got a shot because of my skin tone? Got to challenge that man to fight Tommy Gunn. And if he refuses, then you gotta insult him. You gotta dog him. You gotta humiliate him. You gotta do whatever you got to do to get him into that ring. But that's what you got to do. Welcome, everyone, to Going the Distance, the Rocky Series podcast. I am your host, Ryan, and I will say this today, ladies and gentlemen, or as George Washington Duke would say, gentlemen and ladies. It's very, very exciting, and I'm very humbled and honored that today we have with us Richard Gant, as we all know, who famously played George Washington Duke in Rocky V. Richard, welcome, and how are you? Well, I'm fine, and I'm glad that uh, we get to sit back and recreate a bit of uh, Rocky Five. That was a 1990 production quite a while ago, but it still resonates. It abs- You know what? It absolutely does. And this is not to take away anything from your illustrious career. I looked at IMDb, 138 credits to your name. Does that sound about right? That's about right. Okay, so we're going to tease the audience here. We're not going to get into Rocky Five just yet because I want to know you a little bit, Richard. I think it's fair, and I think our audience would like to know, you know, what brought you into the world of acting? Where were you born and raised, and what influenced you as a youth to even become an actor to decide, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to do this. I'm going to take this on. I am from Berkeley, California. Oh, okay. Coming out of the service, I was introduced to theater. So it wasn't before that. So the only plays I had seen would have been church plays or something on television. Uh, We had managed, however, in uh, junior high school and maybe even elementary school to be bused to the concerts and opera over in San Francisco at the San Francisco Opera House, that famed company and building. Okay. I had a, a notion of pageantry as far back as then. I had always been in choirs, junior choirs, church choirs had performed in the service in the drum and bugle corps. And when I got out, I was in a dance group, but I never thought of it as acting. I never looked at it in that way. So when I was introduced to theater and stood on stage for the first time in my life and projected to the back row, I was shocked, pleased, I guess, to understand that, well, this is my future. It's very clear now. Yeah, well, you have a very strong, distinct voice, and you must have known this at a young age. That you were able to project your voice to that back row in the theater. No, no, that was when I was 22 years old. <laughs> <laughs> well, did you, I'm sure this voice was there as a child. Well, I, I was not allowed in certain singing groups that I wanted to be in. <laughs> so <laughs> That's awesome. So, what, what did you do in the service? I heard that you're in the service. I'm a Navy man myself. I'm actually a sonar operator here in the Royal Canadian Navy. Oh, well, we were close. I was in radar uh, in the Air Force. AF-27350 A and B. What did that entail? Directed air uh, air traffic uh, throughout the sector. Awesome. And how long did you do that service for? Four years. Good for you. Well, thank you for your service. We, we, we do appreciate it. Yeah, so, Royal Canadian uh, Air Force gave me a ride once. <laughs> did we do okay by that? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was stationed in Grand Forks, North Dakota. And so I went up to Winnipeg to the station up there and got a hop to uh, Andrews Air Force Base in Washington, D.C. Your first movie was 1980. Without the math in my head, I can't do it, but how old were you in 1980? 1980? First of all, that could not have been my first movie. Well, it's the first uh, one from INDB, I think. Uh, it was Attica, a TV movie? Uh, okay, that's what they're counting as the first one. Okay, so I was, uh, I was born in 44, so... 
36? Whatever that is. <laughs> 80, well, 84, then I would have been 40, so 36. For your movie career started off being in a movie with Morgan Freeman. Oh, that was Attica, yeah. Uh, we were all in New York at the same time. We were all going to writers' workshops together, and I was directing him in shows, actually. Oh, wow. Um, in readings and in shows, plays. So we were all great friends. All of us ended up leaving New York just about the same time, in 1990, coming out to uh, uh, California. And how was uh, Morgan Freeman as an individual? Oh, he was fine. He was an old, well-seasoned actor by that point. He had been on Electric Company for a good almost 10 years. Right. Uh, That's right. I know that. I remember that show. <laughs> he was uh, He was great. Great. Uh, he was and still is... Um, an icon. So, I'm just going through your IMDb, and I'm I'm looking at what sticks out to me as a 43 year old uh, TV and movie goer. What I would have seen you throughout my life. It's amazing how much stuff you've been in. Where inadvertently I, I saw you, but didn't know know who you were until eventually Rocky Five, which became a big part of my life, and that's when I knew knew you by face. So ever since I've seen Rocky Five, I've I see you every time I see you in a in a movie or TV show. I go, I know that's you now. But before yeah. Rocky Five, I'm just looking at. You worked with in a movie called Suspect with Cher, Dennis Quaid, and Liam Neeson. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That was very interesting. Uh, there was somebody else in that uh, guy who played... John uh, Mahoney? No, uh-uh. Joe Mantegna? Yeah, Montagna. Oh, Joe Montagna. Yeah. Yeah, he's uh, he's had a great career, television career since then. Yes, he uh, was that in uh, Criminal Minds, was that him? Criminal something. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hey, he's... he's been on that for a good 10 years. Yeah, that show never dies. <laughs> yeah, right. And then you were on the Cosby show. Yeah, um, yeah, I forget the other guy who was the other moving man with me. Uh, he has since done commercials for National Auto Rent. That strange fellow who steps through it in a 1960s garb, high heel shoes and all, and gets a car. Uh, you'll see the commercial at some point. He's done a lot of stuff, but oh, sure, that yeah. guy and I were on the Cosby show together. And uh, you, we don't have to say anything controversial about Bill Cosby. That's not my intent. I was just curious, though, like what was it like to, to be around somebody at that time who was the star that he was? Cosby was consummate. He was a person on a sitcom who could, on a sitcom now, just take off and go his own direction, and it was expected. Right. He was a beloved person on the set and on the screen right it was a it was a pleasure that was my first multi-camera sitcom so all praises to uh the cosby show for that for giving me that break absolutely and then you went from that and you did uh, miami vice <laughs> miami vice so it was it was an interesting show i was a fighter the character's name was battling barry gay <laughs> yeah 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 uh, I was on with a very interesting um, actor. By that time, that show had reached an iconic status. Oh, yeah. And to be able to do it was uh, wonderful. Uh, some of the people that I had hoped to see, I did not see. Olivia Brown, for instance, was in it, and she was the beauty of the ages at right. that time. Sure. She wasn't in any scenes that I was in. Did you share the screen with Don Johnson? Nope. Okay. I heard no. a rumor. I heard a rumor that he walks on boxes to be taller. Is that true, or is that somebody else? <laughs> I wouldn't know. I I didn't see it. The actor playing Tubbs. I was uh, in the scenes. The, my scenes were with him. Great. Yeah, he's great. I like. I love this character. Yeah. And, and then you did a, a movie in '89 again with Jay Leno and Pat Morati. Uh, uh, yeah, Morito. Uh, Pat Morito. Yeah. Uh, Jay Leno was hilarious. I think that's the only film that he says he did. Ever. Sure. It was funny, and every now and then I see him uh, in Hollywood driving one of his vehicles, and he'll he'll wave and sometimes stop and talk. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, he loves his cars. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Now, we're sneaking up to Rocky Five, but before we do, you were in a film called The Freshman, of course, with Marlon Brando Matthew, and Matthew Broderick. It was a hilarious time, and we shot it up in Canada again in uh, Toronto. Okay. In Toronto and in New York City. Marlon Brando did not get along with the producer. Uh-oh. And I saw him try to swing and hit him in his face once. 
they got into an argument. It was hilarious. <laughs> Did Marlon Brando get along with anybody? It seems like he, as talented as he may be as an actor, and he's, he certainly is credited for that method acting method that he seemed to have started, but it seems like he might have been a difficult person to work with from what I've read about him on various movies. He may have been for the director and producers. For the other actors, he was fine. Oh. You know, he, he, you know, no, no problem. Wanted to hear what you had to say about things. Very interested. Uh, was funny at times. <laughs> but <laughs> on that show, he and the D and the producer did not get along. Did not. <laughs> oh, it was hilarious. Uh, and I love Matthew Broderick personally. I think he's a, a great talent. Matthew, he was younger at that age. He had already done the iconic film in Chicago. I can't think of the name uh, of it. Ferris Bueller's Day Off? I think he had already done that. Yeah, yeah, he did. He was a little bit older, but he still had that kind of questing youth about him. Mm. You know, and so, uh, so it was fun to work with him. So these... I haven't worked with him since, though. Oh, okay. This is a, a good building block that you've got going on here. Let's now get into uh, what our audience is waiting for, your role in Rocky V, because just like your character who comes out of nowhere in that press conference and starts yelling at Rocky, and uh, mm-hmm. you, your career feels like this kind of, you came into the public eye kind of out of nowhere, in a sense, loud and, and, and in charge. and Good. <laughs> yeah. I will say I asked my audience on Twitter and on Facebook, one, that I was very excited to do this interview, and two, if they had any questions. Because I can't think of every question. I want, to, I want people to be involved in this interview, not just, just me asking you questions. And there are, there, the response was overwhelming that I can't a- ask every single question that people had, but I, I do have them in front of me. We're going to naturally get to the, some of them anyways. Before we get to the actual stuff that happened that we see on screen – how did you hear about this movie, and how did you get the role? How did you audition? And just tell us your story about getting to to uh, the first day of shooting. An uh, agent called me in for an audition. I had read the material and had a certain affinity for it because I had seen enough of uh, Don King. He was a well-known figure at that point. Oh, yes. <laughs> so I had him down pat in terms of um, attitude and lingo. Went in there was disappointed because what I thought was the, going to be the director auditioning, I assumed that this was a, a techie because he had a camera and was taking pictures of the audition, Okay. a video of the audition. And so I did it and uh, walked out, uh, ran into another actor whose name I will not say, who was also auditioning, and he was shook up. He was uh, sweating and said the director... Uh, ran him through his paces and he didn't appreciate it or he couldn't get it together or something. Oh, wow. This happens for everybody as an actor, by the way. Sure. There's one role that is just you, and that's all it is to it. And this was me. <laughs> the guy was saying, well, now take the script. Take a script now. Take the script with you. Uh, I said, okay, and walked out, you know, kind of disappointed, kind of bummed. Right. Uh, you, you said you had the script. How much of the script did you have? The whole movie or just your parts? And were you told to play like Don King? That was one of the questions people had is how much were you told to play play it like Don King? And how much did you just do that on your own? Or was that direction by Avildsen or Stallone? I did it on my own. Uh, later, when we got to the read-through, Stallone admitted that it was it was Don King. The writing pretty much spoke to you in a Don King type character, and Stallone basically said, "You know what? Yeah, it's based on King. Have at it." Yeah, it was written that way, uh, so I just did it that way. Well, you nailed it. <laughs> I mean, the only thing missing was the hair. Right, right, right. Well, Don King, as it turns out, uh, I read, came to the point where he didn't like uh, my portrayal, uh, <laughs> only because. He had heard enough about it. I mean, people kept trying to either tell him about it or or match me up with him some kind of way in terms of my being able to do him, and he came to not like it. <laughs> wow. It was funny. I read it in the Times, too, by the way, in the New York Times. Funny. Well, needless to say, and I will say this, I'm not trying to blow smoke here, Richard. That's not my intent, but your role is so memorable and so quotable and I want to talk about 
the lines that you delivered, <laughs> the panache, and the way you deliver those lines, your cadence and your voice, it, it's it's hilarious. Just like how you even said, "gentlemen and ladies," the way you the way you say things is that. <laughs> I mean, obviously you're acting, but how did you know to make yourself sound that way? Every now and then, once in your career, you're going to run across something that is so totally and uniquely up your alley. Mm. And that's what that was. I, I, I can't claim credit. Well, you gotta claim I really little, can't. You've got to claim a little bit of credit. You did, the, you, did, you did all the heavy lifting there. I, I, I had fun. I rose to the occasion, I thought. I thought one of my best scenes, by the way, was in the beginning when I walked into the the hangar. Oh yes, Avelson, quite frankly, didn't like my my opening work, and I'm not even sure that made it to the movie. The Aeroflot airline lands, okay. doors open, Stallone appears, and when he looks out, there's a parade waiting for him. There's marching bands, etc., mm-hmm. etc., et yeah. and I'm driving through in a limousine, standing up out the window at the top of the ceiling, Mm -hmm. standing up there, shouting, Rocky Balboa, Rocky Balboa, (laughs) Rock Balboa. And I'm screaming at the top of my lungs because that's what the character would do. Now, Appleson didn't like that, come to find out later. He thought that Don King should should have been much more elegant. Mm. What? Kind of wish you'd have told me that, but... um, that's not the Don King that I know. Well, I will say that the George Washington Duke character is, I would say he is elegant. He is truly a master of the word. He, the way he delivers and the, and the speeches that he deliver and the, the way you play that antagonist, it is elegant. You can't be that character and speak poorly. Well, to that end, I see your point. But uh, Don King that I was trying to portray uh, was a person who... Um, he has his way, yes, no two ways about that, but he's he's bound and determined to reduce you to some kind of serfdom, some kind of minion, to reduce you to a pug and uh, go from there. But those words are all Stallone's, and that's the brilliance of Stallone, by the way. Those words primarily are the, his. The only thing I ever added was, again, back at the beginning of when we walked into the hangar, back to that whole uh, Rocky Balboa thing, Okay, and... Uh, I said something like, champion of all the Americas and all the Russias. I love that. Something something like that. Those were mine, but other than that, that's all Stallone. All Stallone. That is incredible. Thank you for answering that question before I even asked it. That was one of the main questions I had, is how much did you ad-lib, and how much is Stallone's writing? So I guess credit where credit's due for Stallone's writing on that character. Yeah, oh, absolutely. But my background is theater. Mm -hmm. And in theater, it's about the writer's words. Mm. About that. So that's what you have to get first. Oh, sorry. Can I ask a meaty question? Uh Uh-huh, certainly. So we know that Sylvester Stallone is an alpha personality. There's just no way around it. You can't be a Hollywood icon the way he is and be in the successful movies of Rocky and Rambo at this time. And he wrote the character Rocky. He wrote the first six Rockies, as we know. And at this time, this would have been his fifth Rocky. He directed parts two, three, and four. I guess it's two-part. What was it like for you to work first under the direction of John G. Albertson? And was there any conflict, if you're willing to share, between actor Sylvester Stallone and this... Was it a troubled shoot? I guess It was I, troubled in the way that uh, they, were, they had problems making magic happen. And in movie making, it's about magic. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's about setting things up and looking for magic. And that kind of wasn't happening. We were supposed to finish shooting, I think, in seven weeks, and it ended up being like 16 weeks or something like that, if I remember correctly. Uh, They just couldn't get it right. And the the main thing they couldn't get right was the fight scenes outdoors. We did it in Pennsylvania at first and then went back to to, uh, Los Angeles and did it and then Back to Philadelphia again, uh, <laughs> trying to get it right. Right. Before we get to the fight scene, what was it like working for John G. Avelson? What was your working relationship with him like? It was all right. Avelson had directed maybe one or two films before that. His background was as an editor. I'm sure he got his camera straight and the movement right, this, that, and other. 
But um, again, that point that I had, that problem I had with him, the communication simply wasn't there. It might have been me. There was some missing elements there for me. And then there was a lot of tension on the set because, again, remember, I was telling you that the, the, some magic wasn't happening. Right. And movies are about uh, getting things done on time. Right. It's and, yeah, sure, it's a business. Right. And when things are not happening, emotions flare and people are about to get fired. And at the beginning of the film, there were a lot of people getting fired because they might have auditioned well or powers that be thought that they were the right person. Mm -hmm. But uh, my partner, I think, changed twice before I got the guy that ultimately ended up being my partner, whose name I can't remember at this point. Now, his background is very interesting. He's a policeman. He was a policeman in Los Angeles. Uh, I mean, in New York City. And he was famous for solving the Preppy Park murder. Really? That happened. Uh, yeah, that happened in like maybe 86. 788, something like that. They found out that it was a socialite who did it. Oh, wow. And called the Preppy Park murder. And he evidently turned the fellow or uh, got him to confess some kind of a way. And that was his claim to fame. In some kind of way, he had met Stallone and he worked out. He worked out that he was an okay actor. Is that Mike Sheehan? Yes, Mike Sheehan. Okay. Typical New York City. Irish cop. Wow, that's really cool. I did not know that. I wonder how many of our listeners knew that. He uh, came out of, uh, he said he graduated from college. And his buddies looked around, they'd graduated. Now what are we going to do? <laughs> and said, well, let's, you know, let's go on down here. And, and they ended up in the police department. And, you know, 20 years later, they retired. Did you know about the original ending of Rocky dying? Uh, you, you, yes, I did hear that. Uh, and he wasn't going to do it some kind of way. And... Yeah, I had heard that. Uh, the ending, though, was very interesting because one of the problems in the film was they couldn't understand who the protag who the antagonist was. Hmm. They kept trying to make it be Tommy Gunn, yeah. But no, the antagonist was me. <laughs> they, You know, it, I, I had to fight for it. So once it was clear who the antagonist was, and that wasn't until October and the film was opening in November... Right. <laughs> they were at odds. Well, and, and I agree that that was a loop for the audience that we were, in a way, we weren't rooting for Rocky just to beat up Tommy Gunn the way we'd done with Drago or Clubber Lang or Apollo Creed. We, exactly. were, we were disappointed and saddened by his fallen state that he had, you know, basically gone to the dark side of boxing because of your character. And... <laughs> You were like, yeah, you were the evil emperor who enticed this talented young boxer to come over to the dark side for the money and the girls and the and the quick, easy way to a championship. Right. When you when you know that when you when you view you as your character as the antagonist as the bad guy, the film I think holds more water today than it maybe did when it first came out. I think it just threw people for a loop that Tommy betrayed Rocky, and I think a lot of people focused on the betrayal of Tommy instead of your corruptness as a character. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> Which is what a good bad guy does. You know, you don't even have anything stick on you, even after the movie's over. Right, there you go. Now, Tommy Morrison was very interesting. Please tell. He was, at that moment, he was a contender. He was a heavyweight contender. Mm -hmm. Now, they had auditioned uh, several other fighters. Not for the Tommy Morrison role, but for the other fighters role. Doggone it, I can't think of his name now. You, you need Mike King? Who? Yeah, well, his character's name was Union Kane. Union Kane. Char that was the character's name. Several other fighters had auditioned for it. Bone Crusher was one of them. Wow. And I think he, at that point in his life, I think he couldn't remember the combinations. He couldn't right. remember the choreography. He couldn't remember it. So if you don't remember the choreography, you're going to kill somebody. Mm. So <laughs> so uh, didn't end up being the fighter. And I think there's one or two others that... I saw audition and Union King was the character name, but the actor that played him was Michael Anthony Williams. Michael Williams, yes, yes, absolutely. Mike was a fighter. His claim to fame was that he was the only other guy that that got knocked out by uh, Buster Douglas, or he had went fifteen rounds with Buster, one one or the other. But he was a fighter. He was a, he was a good fighter. 
Yeah, I heard that he was a, a boxer in real life. I wasn't familiar with his career, though. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was very athletic. He was one of those guys who could jump over the top uh, rope uh, all the way over, clear it. And he would do that often as that was his entrance into the ring. <laughs> right. Yeah. As an actor, it was interesting, though, talking to Mike, because he admitted that there was a certain stardom that went along with being a fighter. He knew that those days were waning for him. Mm. And he wasn't quite sure uh, how to go forward after that, knowing how life was being fetid in the way uh, people do celebrities. So it was interesting. Mike was interesting. Haven't talked to him since either. either. Oh, that was one of the questions, actually, is if you kept in touch with him. Yeah, Tommy, I ran into him a couple of times since and was supposed to make some uh, appearances with him in Oklahoma, but he was uh, incarcerated at the time. Yeah, <laughs> understood. Yeah. He was a guy who, in life, probably never should have come to Hollywood. He should have stayed a fighter. He was a contender. Uh, so you think uh, his... Being in this film might have hurt his professional career. Oh, absolutely. No two ways about that. He was a country boy out of Oklahoma and I think Kansas City or something like that. Uh, he played football, had some martial arts training. Yeah, I was a fan of his as a fighter. But, you know, life has its own ways of showing itself. And he was enchanted with the life of an actor, the life of a star in Hollywood. I remember getting in a limousine with him by mistake with him and some of his buddies and they were driving down Hollywood Boulevard yelling out the windows doors wide open you know sure just glorious time yeah <laughs> told him to pull over let me out <laughs> Tommy Morrison gets a lot of flack for his role in Rocky 5 do you think that's fairly given or do you think we should give him more credit and I give him more credit personally and I know a lot of people do but he seems to be People will give him a lot of flack for his role as Tommy Gunn. Do you think that's fair? Why? Are you aware of Rocky V's standing in the Rocky franchise? Nope. No, not, not at all? Right, were you a Rocky fan before Rocky V came out? Like, were, were you familiar with the film, seen them, enjoyed them? or? In 1983, I was in uh, uh, West Africa. I was there doing work. I, had, uh, I was there for about a year doing work. And not as a performer at all. Right. I was at the State House in the Capitol, sitting around, and there were some movies there. I think there was Rocky One, Two, and Three there, and that was the first time that I had seen them. Oh wow! I mean, I just certainly knew of them, uh, and knew about Stallone and all that, but I simply had never seen the films. Uh, so it was very interesting that six to seven years later, I'm cast in uh, uh, Rocky Five gone back to what I was supposed to be doing in the first place, which was theater and not fooling around in West Africa <laughs> and uh, uh, ended up getting the role. So it is all very interesting, but no, I don't know Rocky five standing. I would imagine that um, Rocky one and two were probably the iconic Rockies. I don't know where the whole Russia thing fit into. Um, that was Rocky four. Yeah, I don't know where that fit in the hierarchy of the Rockies, if that was considered iconic or not. I know that Stallone had thought, or he said to me, that he thought the Clubber Lane fight uh, was his best fight or his best antagonist. Hmm. You know, that's interesting. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm interested. I, I find it inter interesting, too. I, I would have thought it would have been Apollo Creed, but... Yeah, well, maybe those haymakers that... <laughs> Clubber Lane was throwing <laughs> were uh, stronger, perhaps, than Apollo Creed's were. Yeah, maybe. What people want to know, however, is, or I should say first, that Rocky V, amongst the fans of the franchise, there, there are many, there are millions, and we're all pretty fanatical, they rate this one usually pretty low. It doesn't mean it's not a good film, but in the Rocky world, it's a lot of people's least favorite. And people want to know... Not because of your part or everyone's part separately. I think everyone did a good job. Talia Shire was amazing. Uh, Burt Young was amazing. Like everyone played their roles just fine as they've always done in previous films. But for some reason, this movie is mixed because 
people feel, maybe you can confirm or not, that there was a struggle between Sylvester Stallone and the director, and I think that plays out in the final product. There was a struggle, of course. Avelson was replaced by Stallone at some point. So it's very interesting to, to watch what Stallone brought to it rather than what Avelson did. Avelson was, you know, he's okay. He put people in the right positions and moved them along as he understood it. Stallone had a bit of a different take. He concentrated on power. He concentrated on uh, a lot of cutaways that Avelson didn't do. For instance, when uh, Rocky would get, it would be about time to fight or do something. There'd be a cutaway to Rocky's hand going into a fist. Now, Avelson didn't do that, for instance. Mm. The whole thing about, oh, what's the character's name that was the old trainer? Yeah, Mickey. Mickey, yeah. The whole thing about Mickey looking up at the subway, at the elevated train, and Mickey saying, get up and fight again, fight again. All that was Stallone. That wasn't Avelson's viewpoint at all. Perhaps the problem was the studio, I guess, wanted this to be the last of the Rockies, and Stallone wasn't for that and had to push it a different way. So maybe that was it. Hmm. What are your thoughts or any stories on Sylvester Sloan as an individual? Now, I had come out of theater. Mm -hmm. I had performed with Brando and with uh, Cher, among others. Morgan was a star. I was very familiar with Broadway-type stars. You know, I had been on Broadway and was in and around that. But Stallone brought a different kind of flavor to it. And perhaps it was a Hollywood flavor. Now, you've got to understand that when Cher showed up for her scenes in that film that we did together, she was definitely a star. Her first day on the on the set, I mean, we were in a room. Uh, it was a bunch of people. Oh, it was a courtroom. And and uh, they stopped the, the shooting because Cher had arrived. Right. Now, this is up in um, Toronto. Cher had on this long fur coat. And so she is walking down the aisle and managed to drop the coat off of her shoulders onto the floor and kept on walking, of course. And some minion jumped up and grabbed the coat and was trying to say, share, share. So, I mean, I saw that kind of star. Right. It was clear, right? <laughs> okay, star. Give him a star entrance. Gotcha. <laughs> Stallone was different. Now, let me tell you about Brando. Brando, at that point, done a film in eight or ten years when he did The Freshman. Okay. He was looked at as a recluse, the kind of actor that you will not see again in your lifetime because of the breadth of his work and his stature and the stories about him and all of that. Right. Brando, when he first came on the set, we back up in Toronto again, we were in the kitchen of this restaurant, the end of a scene, and everybody was mesmerized by the fact that this is Brando in front of them. Brando picked up a fork. Scene was over. He picked up a fork and was examining it. And every single person on that set was riveted watching Brando, mm. just watching him raise that fork and considering the fork. Including me. I'm just staring, mouth open, just watching him work. Right. Now, it wasn't Stallone. Stallone uh, was much more down to earth, but he was a star. Mm -hmm. And you watched a star work. You just watched it. He was hell on the crew, but to other actors, he was cool. He was fine. Not a problem. I've heard that he he's one of the hardest working people on the film, like, would you say that he's the hardest, a hardworking person, or um, he had his fun? But um, no, he was—he would be the hardest working person there. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, and so that's what—that's what I like in a good leader. Is it's one thing to be hard on your crew in, in the working sense, but he's in the trenches with them. I, I would presume. Oh yes, 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 absolutely, absolutely. He learned how to be a star by watching him. The other folks, it was impossible. Brando, what you going to do? Right. If you hadn't gone through that kind of method at th at that time, you couldn't be Brando. Right. Uh, share, well, share, please. Well, yeah, those are different levels. The, the the pop singers or singers or even today the the big stars, they're they're on a different level, the uh, the music stars, than actors. Though they're all on a celebrity level, but there are certain types of, like Lady Gaga is the sheriff today type thing. <laughs> Lady Gaga, okay. 
yeah. if, if I was to make a comparison, it's somebody when they probably walk on set or walk on stage, everyone just kind of watches. You know, it's a different yeah. it's a different level of stardom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so that probably makes sense. Maybe why Rocky Five suffered, according to fans and maybe some critics, of an uneven discourse would be the struggle and the disjointed filming process. Perhaps there was not as you're telling me this. There was a storybook kind of a way that it proceeded. And maybe this wasn't a storybook. The villain was very clear, and the others, an impossible fight. This was a much more realistic fight, I think, in terms of the elements and where they were. And the others, he perhaps were, was up against a different kind of an odds than he was here. So I agree with that. I think the problem with Rocky Four to Five was is Rocky Four. He fought, you know, this giant, this this almost machine of a man. How do you top that? And so I think the idea with Rocky Five was to bring it back down to, you know, reality. He loses his money. It's about family connections, and that's where you come in as the antagonist. I think is the enemy isn't someone he's just gonna fight. It's uh, he's fighting it with. It's an internal struggle that you present to him. And not his storybook, perhaps. No, I think a lot of people had a hard time seeing Rocky lose his money. <laughs> I think we as an audience never like to see people lose money. <laughs> <laughs> My only point was that it's all about Stallone to me. It was interesting watching Talia. Talia was very, how can you say it? It was interesting remembering how she was in Rocky 1, 2, and 3, and then to see her here. She was prettier here. She was meant to be prettier and more, I guess, natural mm -hmm. than she was as the wilting flower that she was in uh, perhaps one and two. Sure. That was of interest. Any thoughts on uh, Burt Young? I thought I saw Burt Young two days ago. I was in Las Vegas. I'm doing a show now with Gabriel Iglesias. He's a Mexican comedian yeah. who is huge in, um, in his demographic. So we're doing a sitcom called Mis Mr. Iglesias. Okay. We all went to Las Vegas to see his stand-up that he was doing at the Mirage. And the next day, I'm down at one of the cafeterias, one of the cafes, eating, and I could have sworn that the guy three people from me was Burt Young. I said, Burt? And the guy didn't turn around, so you kind of leave it at that, sure. realizing that, well, Burt Young I knew was 30 years ago, so let's not overstep here <laughs> but i swear i thought i saw burt young now before we close the chapter on rocky five there are fans of yours uh, richard that had questions outside the scope of rocky five and in, in particular and you might get a chuckle out of this is your moment as a coroner in uh, jason goes to hell the final friday <laughs> <laughs> they want to know what was it like eating jason's heart it was rubber with green jelly so, I mean, that, 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 that's what it was. Now, the funny thing about that show to me was there was a scene where I had become Jason and I was running around gushing people. Yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm at a campsite. I realized that there are two people in, in a tent making love. In reality, they were two actors who used to go together, boyfriend and girlfriend, but couldn't stand each other, and both of them got cast in this film as lovers. Oh, boy. <laughs> so you gotta, you got to put your acting hat on there, I guess. You got to put your hat on, acting hat on, and so that was hilarious to me. I found that out after I gushed them uh, uh, with a steak. <laughs> gushed them. In, I like that. Uh, years later, yeah. So that's pretty hilarious. cool that you were in a, the Rocky franchise and the in the Friday the 13th franchise, pretty two iconic franchises, and you're known quite well for both roles, even having only been in one film each in those franchises. Wow. <laughs> like, I got more, I got second to the Rocky film, I got questions about your time on uh, Friday the 13th was number two. Wow. Wow. Hey, it was interesting. I remember getting cast. Adam, I can't think of his last name, was the director. I haven't seen him since. Adam Marcus. You figured you'd run across people again, but... Sometimes you just don't. His name was Adam Marcus. Adam Marcus, yes. <laughs> I remember Adam Marcus had stepped off the set once. The scene was going to go again. He came back on the set, and the, the scene, A.D. had started up the scene again. It just said, action. <laughs> he walked on. 
looked around, said, cut! Who who did this? Who did that? It was hilarious to me. Uh, the same year, you worked on Seinfeld in one of their most highly rated and watched episodes called The Pilot in Season 4. Seinfeld was funny. It was, again, um, a staple in the industry by that point. Mm-hmm. I think I am in the exact same exact same place that I was then when I shot uh, when I, when we were shooting um, Mr. Iglesias. I think it's the exact same stage. I believe it is. That we shot Seinfeld. Seinfeld was funny. Kind of don't remember that much about it. Okay. Although I do have a picture book with that scene in it from the Seinfeld series. That's a pretty um, amazing that you were on that show. I mean, that's an iconic show. Uh, it was. They used to do it. Any stories on Steven Seagal and your time with him on Glimmer Man? I had been told by a buddy of mine who did a film with him in Jamaica. I forget the name of it. Anyway, he told me, he said, now, now watch out for Seagal, because if you're in a fight scene with him, you might get clocked. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> well, it didn't turn out that that's what my character was at all, so that was good. Uh, he's he's all right, you know. He's he's, he's Seagal, and he's going to bring his kind of energy there and go with it. You sure. Know? You worked with one of our podcast favorite topics, uh, Burt Reynolds, in a movie called Raven. Burt Reynolds. I ran into Burt Reynolds years later. I was somewhere, and I felt somebody come up and goose me, and I turned around, and there he was, standing there smiling. A little older now, but sure. just smiling. Bert didn't take himself seriously. He wasn't. He wasn't that kind of an actor. So it was a joy to work with him. Oh, good. Yeah, he seems like a nice guy. Oh um, yeah. People commented on your time on NYPD Blue. NYPD Blue kind of turned the uh, kind of turned things around for me. Not around, but uh, I turned a corner with NYPD Blue. I first auditioned and got a a scene in NYPD Blue where I was a bus driver that had seen. A suspect. They wanted to know about this guy, and I described him, and uh, they thought he was an Indian, and I said, no, this guy definitely wasn't an Indian. So the way I did that, I was able to walk onto that set, and I haven't been able to do it since, quite frankly. I walk onto that set and divide up that scene that they wanted me to do. I found stage business to do that, in effect, made the scene. The scene was no longer about um, these guys bringing in a bus driver to tell them what he thought of or to describe a particular villain. No, it was about me wanting some coffee, (laughs) something to drink. (laughs) And from that, they called me back to be a desk sergeant. And in another episode, I came back, did the episode, and Sipowitz was in it and his partner, who I can't remember. I made the scene be about me messing with Sipowitz. I wasn't going to give Sipowitz what he wanted. I was supposed to give him some paper and say something, give him a file. And I didn't want to do it and slammed it down or something, something, something. I can't remember. Right. It was enough of a quick antagonism that they called me back, changed the character again. Yep. And now I was this detective. Yeah. You played four different roles on it. Sergeant Bill Dornan, Desk Sergeant Leroy Glover, Eighth Desk Sergeant Sundrum. So four different roles. Yeah. And from that now, that's how I ended up getting Deadwood. I was going to ask you about that. Uh, are you going to be in the uh, new Deadwood movie? No, I'm dead. Yeah, I, I can remember. I've seen Deadwood, but it's been a long time. I figured you probably die. <laughs> Milch, David Milch, said that he wanted he wanted me to do the same character in Deadwood. We call it in the industry uh, the noble black. Right. Uh, Here is a guy who is so noble that he becomes a destructive element to himself and anybody around him. He's going to kill himself some kind of way, out of righteousness. And his righteousness is what is going to be devil, the lead character. And so that's what I ended up playing on Deadwood. And we knew Deadwood was, for me, the television show. Mm. We knew that somebody in our little group was going to get killed. And we didn't know who. And one day, Milch walked past me and wouldn't look at me. And I said, Milch, Milch, hold up now. Milch, is it me? Is it, is, is it me? Damn it, am I the one? <laughs> <laughs> and of course, I was the one. You're right. Yeah. Love Deadwood. Um, we went up to the town of Deadwood 
to do a you know media tour, and we found out that there was 50 people a month being killed on that street, on that main street. Oh wow! It was a town with no law right. and gold, and there you are. It's a bad combination. Bad combination. But I loved it. I loved Deadwood. We were walking on the set when I first got there, and you looked around at a lot of the extras, and a lot of them had beards and whatnot, and you knew that these guys were never, ever going to get a show like this again. This was their, um, this was it. This was the best thing they was going to get. It was a great set, great show. Walking on the back lot, the back street of that set, there were a lot of wooden cages back there where the Chinese people lived. Pig pens were and all of that. And I asked the director or the set person, what were these cages for? And they said those were for the Chinese prostitutes. Oh, that boy. time, the Chinese prostitutes were slaves. And they were put in these cages, and they would never get out of the cage again in their life. Boy. Their life expectancy in those caves were like seven years, in cages rather, like seven years. The handlers would dope them up. The price towards the end would be like five cents. The Johns would just get up in the cage with them and, you know, do their business and get out. Ugh, terrible So time. Deadwood was a desperate kind of a place. Great place to do a show, though, to do a show around. For me, that was the best thing that I'd ever done, television-wise. Oh, that's incredible. That's I didn't know that. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Quite welcome. Quite welcome. So before we close, we have a couple last questions I think people might be remiss if I didn't ask. One individual asked what your thoughts are about participating in the movie Crush Groove back in 85, oh. acting alongside such future legends like Run DMC and Curtis Blow. I came back from Africa to do that show. Didn't know it was going to be as, again, that word iconic as it became. I was able to see all of these people at a very early stage of their development. Mm -hmm. It was interesting. It was very interesting, and I enjoyed it much so what are your opinions of hip-hop culture at that time and how do you feel about the film's impact today who knew that it would be like that <laughs> every time i run into russell simmons he would say the line uh, that i had in the show um drop you to your knees russ <laughs> um hip-hop culture at that time in new york city remember we were in new york was kind of confined to uh queens and uh, the outer boroughs you saw these guys at block parties. That's where you saw the MCs and the people on the boxes that you manipulate with your hands and whatnot. That's where you saw them. And it was all very interesting, but you kind of knew that part of the culture. New York City was so alive back then that there was always something different happening. And you didn't know which one of these things was going to take off like they ultimately did. Remember, Studio 54 was going on at that time. And so disco was, wasn't even competing with uh, hip-hop. Hip-hop overcame it later on, but not then. Now, hip-hop, I ran into Curtis Blow maybe a year ago. And he's still doing his thing, but at that time he was king of the hill. Right. Very interesting how time moves along. To even have any kind of time in the sun is better than a lot of people. <laughs> yeah, look at that. Yeah. That fur coat that you wore in Rocky Five, <laughs> is that real fur? And did you get to keep it after the film? No, I got to keep the other costumes, but I didn't get the coat. Oh, heck no. The coat was like seven or $8,000, I think. Oh, was it real? Yeah. Yeah, it was. That's amazing. It was a borrowed thing. I'm sure that whoever we rented it from didn't think that there's going to be the show was going to last as long as it did in in, uh, in production. <laughs> but it, And it wasn't that warm. You would think it was, but but by October in Philadelphia, it's cold. And, <laughs> and that cold didn't necessarily keep you as warm as you would think that it sure. would. The final fight in the street, do you believe, solve this uh, debate for me, because I have my answer. Do you think the fight should have happened in the ring or outside, ultimately? I never even thought about it. My argument at that time was, it's not about that fight, it's about me. I can remember when they finally gave me that last line. I said, uh, Rocky Balboa, Rocky, you outclassed the bum. And Stallone looks around, sees me, turns back to the priest and says, Father, oh, excuse me a minute, or whatever he says, comes over to me. And I'm standing there with Danish 
woman who was, uh, she was part of the Danish ballet, by the way. Oh, wow. Yeah, standing there with her. And I said, uh, come on, Pug, hit me. Touch me now, Sue. And he hits me. He hits the stunt man. He really didn't hit me. <laughs> and, you know, flew backwards, flew up on the hood of a car and bounced my head. And he turns back around and says something like... Uh, sue me for what? You sue me for what? Yeah. And then I think the priest says something to him. And it amounts to uh, still good with both hands kind of a thing. Until that point in the shooting, around the 11th or 16th week of however long we spent shooting it, that just ended up ending like that. And you're misquoted, and I thought this is what you said, because you say, come on, pug, as in P-U-G, boxing. Right. Yeah, people think you say punk, and I didn't think you did. No, it was pug. Uh, I got something with my palate. That makes me do that. It's cultural, I'm sure. No, I caught it. I caught it. Can you do me a, a, a small favor? Uh, don't ask me to say that line. No. <laughs> well, no. Which line? The one that downstairs when I'm trying to push Tommy Morrison into doing something. Oh, yeah. Well, that's a great No, I'm not the way you say it because it's just beautiful. But you don't have to. Uh, What's that? Damn, only in America? Yeah, yeah. I got to remember. God damn. Only in America. <laughs> love it. I love it. It should have been more ironic, but I wasn't there as an actor yet. <laughs> well, if you can believe it, uh, Richard, your character is a GIF. You know what that is? G-I-F? Yeah. So that, that line is, <laughs> or, uh, that GIF of, of Only in America is all over the internet. You're on the internet. This character is on the internet. You are, whether you like it or not, you are on the internet as a character in the Rocky Five movie that people use all the time and refer to all the time. What? Oh, yes. Are you kidding me? Are you not aware of this? <laughs> oh. <laughs> now, people, uh, do what I'm, I am aware of is people will run up and start talking about, um, oh, what's that movie? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which I had maybe, uh, to me, 30 seconds on, uh, The Great Lebowski. Yes. And... Uh, you know, and we'll talk. Keep talking about great about huh? You know, I I don't get it, but okay. <laughs> Before we close, how does it feel to be to be Richard Gant? How does it feel to be recognized and to be known and appreciated for your plethora of work? We didn't even touch the surface. How much stuff? Like I said, 130 films. I mean, there's in shows. There's just it'd be a 10 hour podcast. How does it feel? Uh, are you grateful for this? Uh, what I'm grateful for is. It's maybe not that as much as knowing that I'm doing what I was put here on the face of this earth to do. Mm. That I'm grateful for. I kind of didn't get into show business for the other. I got into show business because that's what I was supposed to be doing. Uh, you have fun at it and you appreciate uh, whatever comes your way. No two ways about that. Right. You didn't necessarily get into it for the applause. A lot of times you can get lost in that. Like Mike Williams was saying, you know, he knew that this stardom that he had for a short amount of time, a couple of years, that was about it, right. uh, was drawing to a close. And what was going to happen then? Well, I don't ever want to be in that position. <laughs> well, I don't think you are. You have been a steady, hardworking actor for decades. That's what all of my friends are. So it, it kind of keeps you in balance. <laughs> all of my buddies are basically 30 40 year friends from new york stage and and out here you know and and that's how it is all working actors lately there has been much more recognition by people in the street kind of a thing than before i was happy in my anonymity as a character actor well that's kind of changed yeah yeah you're recognizing and don't worry this podcast isn't big enough to get you any more uh being bothered anymore in the street yeah 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 i'm very happy with what i'm doing i'm um i'm doing a lot of work now strangely enough with the united nations wow building campaigns usually for uh aids awareness global campaigns yeah thank you so for that, that yeah that's pleasing and you have a sense that you are doing good work on stage you know that you have a certain impact that you don't necessarily have in film. 
I can remember people saying, you know, you were doing this play called Home. As a result, I had to go home. I had to leave New York and go home. So that kind of impact happens more in live theater. It's more immediate. Right. Well, Richard, it's been an absolute joy. And I really just can't thank you enough for, for coming on the show and uh, and uh, giving me a, a chance to, to talk to you. I mean, you don't know me from Adam, and I appreciate you doing that and taking time out of your day for this. Well, it was great to reminisce and go back to those times. Uh, any kind of help or impact <laughs> I can have on um, folks out there, I appreciate it. And I'm blessed. Thank you. Thank you very much. And have a good evening. Thank you. Talk to you later. Bye-bye, Richard.